This morning we spoke of uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse um, 7, concerning the fact that the seventh trump was about to sound, not that it was sounding, and that our Father told us He had foretold us all things from the prophets. So if you need to know something, you go to the prophets. What the prophets didn't tell, the apostles did. So you kind of got it all in hand. Nothing to get all uptight about, nothing to worry about. Our Father's in control and He uh, leads us and guides us. So tonight we're going to talk about nations. And that's to say nations as they apply today. We have a lot going on in the world. So that's what we want to talk about is what is happening among the nations, what nations you should be watching. And uh, we'll see what we can make from that, okay? Now, open your Bibles, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 38. Who's coming against us? That's what you want to know. In Ezekiel 38, we are told that Rush, Rush, R-O-S-H in the Hebrew tongue, that it will come against us, but we don't have to worry that much because God's going to stop them. So Ezekiel 38, verse 1, with that word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. What about this nation? And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. This word chief prince in the manuscripts is R-O-S-H. It would later be changed by the Volga to Rush, R-U-S-S, and then later Russia. So we don't have any doubts, this red nation, what, uh, that um, was prophesied all the way back in the 27th chapter of, EZ, of Genesis, 27th chapter of Genesis, that they would always be away from the fat of the land meaning they weren't going to be blessed that much with good crops like we are in this nation and other places in the world that are below that uh, uh, parallel. Now, um, so that identifies it. And we know, watch it, all right? And be careful what they say, what they do. And say, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince, again, Rush, of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor. That covers tanks, jets, you name it, the whole thing, all right? Even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now who's with them? Verse five, Persia. Now, what nation is Persia? It's Iran of today. Got a lot of trouble going on there in Iran. Iran's flexing its muscles and it's gotten away. You know, Iran has declared war on us several times and we haven't done a thing about it. They killed uh, over 200 Marines in uh, Lebanon in a building. They have they, they, that order came straight from the mullahs. And many other things they have done down through the years. And they haven't had to account for it. You know. And they get all upset if you say anything about their religion, like we have some mullahs in up north, Minneapolis, that wanted to pray on an airplane and have seat belts a certain way. And just raise sand, going to sue the people. Do you know that I can't even take a King James Bible into Saudi Arabia? Much less pray. What's quite wrong with that picture? You know, it's about time that uh, something is done here, okay? That's, not, that's going to fester pretty fast now. Okay, who else is there? Persia, Ethiopia. This is those countries, Somalia, and all leading on up and around into Africa. And Libya, Libya's going to be with them. With them, all of them with shield and helmet. 
And so there you've got some nations that you want to watch. Told to you by the government? No, by your heavenly father. This battle takes place at the end times. It doesn't take place, it didn't take place in World War II. It's the end time battle when God himself will put hooks in their mouth when they come against us. Why? Well, most of them claim there's no God. They're atheists. And the reason God's not going to let us turn them around is he wants them to know there is a God. So he's going to do a nice job of turning them around. So, in fact, as long as we protect our dignity, we know our Father's going to take care of this situation. So, turn with me then, if we may. Let's go with some more nations here. Let's take Isaiah chapter 13. Nations we should be concerned with. And I'll warn you, I'm going to give you a little test before we get through. So you want to keep on your toes. I might even, if it's possible, lead you down Primrose Lane. Just to see if you'll go. Okay. As to what you should be worried about. Verse 9 of chapter 13, great book of Isaiah. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and furious anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Did he say he's going to destroy believers? No, you don't have anything to worry about. But he will be a little rough on those that don't think there's a God. Okay? And that day is coming. It's a lot closer than many might think. But you plan like it's forever, but you be ready tomorrow, okay? Always be ready. Verse 10, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light, and the sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Do you know why? Because of the brightness of Almighty God. Nobody will be able to take their eyes off the Savior when he returns. I'm talking about Messiah. Just everything else becomes secondary. His brightness, his smile, his control, his love, dim, makes dim everything else. And I will punish the world for their evil. And boy, we've got plenty of it. And the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Who is the terrible one? And his haughtiness and pride is what started all this trouble to start with in the first earth age. Satan's pride, his downfall. <clears throat> Verse 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. That's the richest, purest gold there is. Therefore, I will stake... I will shake, rather, the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his furious anger. Do you understand the scope of that? Not just shaking the earth like with an earthquake, but also heaven. In other words, it's over. You better be standing on a rock that cannot be shaken. And that rock is the true Messiah. It is the truth of God's word where you're not a sinner being misled down Primrose Lane by a false teacher, a false leader such as false Messiah. And verse 14, and it shall be as a chaste row and as a sheep with no man, which no man, that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. That's to say out of Babylon and out of confusion into their own land. A lot of people are going to wake up. This has a spiritual connotation also. And this is what you work for. Is that when it becomes obvious. And when Christ returns and is in control. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. 
and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. That's to say those that don't belong there, okay? Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled and their wives ravished. You know what that has reference to? Right before the end, when the false Messiah appears, you're going to see mass slaughter of souls, not flesh bodies, of souls. And they're going to dash people into the apostasy of false teaching where they are no longer believers. They sell their soul because of ignorance in worshiping that false shepherd, in worshiping that deceiver claiming with his haughtiness and pride, claiming to be Christ, can't even hold him a candle to see by. But people, because of his miracles, will fall for it. That's why God's elect become more precious than gold, being the eyes of Almighty God and the spirits of God, the Holy Spirit utilizing them to bring the truth, uh, <clears throat> to save those that are lost and to help them. Don't be deceived, it's very important. Behold, I will stir up the meads against them which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Do you know who the Medes are? The Medes are Persia, okay? The bigger part of Persia, the bigger part of Iran today. They're with them. Boy, that little old name just keeps popping up. And it's not good. But our father makes note, and he knew thousands of years ago, he'll straighten the wicked out big time. Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. They don't seem to have much trouble blowing children up in automobiles or in marketplaces. It's true, it's from God's word. Shouldn't be a surprise to a Christian what to expect. And Babylon, that's to say the state of confusion, Iraq, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It's just all, not quite that bad, but I mean in the marketplaces, there are hundreds of innocents are being murdered, slaughtered. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. When the change of dispensations take, time, take place, it's going to be interesting. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs. You know, we've got one old boy named Satyr. Kind of interesting what? Shall dance there. It means demons is what it really means. But it's just so strange how one very cruel person's name almost fits. And the wild beast of the island shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their ple pleasant places. And her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. There's going to be the birth of a new age. It's coming. God has about had it with the wickedness and he's going to destroy the evil in this world. Where are you going to be? Are you going to be helping him? Are you useful to him? Are you familiar with his word enough that you can, you know, if a man hires in laying brick and never lays a brick and doesn't know how, after about 20 years you fire him, right? Yeah. Worthless. God expects you to get, crack the book, to get into it a little bit, to have a, a working knowledge of what it is he expects you to do, what nations to be concerned with. Chapter 14, verse 1. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob. That's all of this natural seed. 
and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land and the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Why? Because of Christ, okay? because of Messiah. They will be captured and we will all be slaves to that wonderful Messiah. Slaves in the sense that we serve him. Maybe you would like the word servants better. But, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids and they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressions. They will teach them the real truth and all the world that wishes to, to um, join shall. And they will have their own kings and queens as it is written in Revelation 21 and they will come there to worship. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. In this world today, in the bondage that we're in in sin, okay, in, in bad nations, in people absolutely thinking they're serving God in destroying souls, it's real sad. And it's a serious, serious situation. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. Now, who is, spiritually speaking, at the very end, the king of Babylon? Satan, of course. And it is Satan that they will say this to. Why is it? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked. That's to say the wicked one, Satan. And the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke. He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. Now you want to pay attention here where trouble's coming from. Okay, This is the answer. This is the nation you should watch. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee. And the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller has come up against us. And he's going to lay down. But do you know who's going to lay him down? Michael. When the Messiah returns, he's going in the pit. And he's going with locks, whereby we can work freely. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. In other words, he's going to have company, lots of it. And, and through that millennium period, certain ones have already been sentenced to death short of the day of judgment. That's to say the Nephilim, the fallen angels, and this one Satan. All they shall speak and say unto thee, art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? In other words, he's supernatural. And he loses every speck of his power. 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of the vials, the worm is spread under thee, that's your sheet. And the worms cover thee, that's your blanket. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the homes and the nations? How was he? Because Christ put him there. Now, who are you supposed to be afraid of and what nation should you really watch? He's kind of tipped you off here. The true king of Babylon. Now I'm going to tell you something and don't you ever, don't you ever start watching nations to the point that you forget who God has warned you against. That's the locust army. That's where the danger is. Is it not written in Revelations chapter 9 that when the Antichrist appears on this earth, he comes during the time of the locust? And it is likened unto that, May through September, even that segment of it. 
and the locust army is called the locust army? Where did he warn you of this in the Old Testament where your real danger was? And I want you to sharpen up. I don't want you looking at Persia. Don't want you looking at Iran. Don't want you looking at Iraq thinking that's where our main danger point is. It isn't. It's where Satan operates and that's with the Kenites. Hidden from sight of most people but the control is always there in that spiritual sense. You were given this warning in the Minor Prophets. Turn with me to the great book of Joel. Joel being translated as Yahweh is God. There's no question about that. He's in control. And this is where God gives you ample warning. He talks about the locust army in chapter 1 of the book of Joel. And what he says is the nor takes away all but leaves and the swarmer takes over then. This is the four stages of the locust. And what the swarmers leave, the devourers take over from. And what the devourers leave, the consumer takes the rest. And then he goes into chapter 1 of this book and says, The churches are stripped clean bare as though a bunch of locusts hit it. They can't even make a crop of new wine. What is Holy Communion? The blood of Christ. That is to say, the true Messiah. How many are taking communion to a fake? Of course, they don't know that. But how many would? Stop and think about it. What he's saying is the locust will strip you clean bare. That's to say Satan's little secret army, which is none other than the Kenites themselves, as they manipulate and as they grow. You've got to be very careful, my friend. What are you to do about it? Leave them alone. Leave the tares alone. Our Father will take care of business. But you better be knowing where to look. Chapter 2, we're going to just spend a little bit of time here. This is the warning. It's your, it's your most important enemy. The enemy you should be watching. Not nations necessarily. And that's not to say any intelligent person observes international policies. But the key is what you want to be interested in as a servant of Christ of God's eyes that walk the earth to observe. Chapter 2, verse 1, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. I'm really thankful that Almighty God gave us a big old 33-foot trumpet that sits in the back of our church that points 22,300 miles out into space. And it sounds the alarm of the end times. And it goes all the way around the world. He's really been good to us. He's really blessed us, just plain folk. Who cares to think big when you've got God's path to follow in thinking truth? Sound the alarm. Watch the enemy. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the uh, mountains. A great people and a strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. That's danger, friend. That's a great army. But do you know what army that is? It's not, it's not uh, Iran. It's not Iraq. It's the locust army. And they are just that way. They are that well dug in. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth, and the land is as the Garden of Eden before them. 
and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. That's why you want to be real careful and you want to know what the score is. You want to know what's going down. And you want to know who your enemy is so that you can be on guard. To be forewarned is forearmed. And that's what your Father wishes for you. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses. And as horsemen, so shall they run. They're not really locusts, you see. They're people. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. They've got it together, friend. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall, be, shall gather blackness, should be translated paleness, frightened, if you don't know the truth. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. They're disciplined. They're really disciplined troops. You don't see that very much anymore. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Some of them are supernatural when they march. Why? They're God's children. They're those that are, I'm sorry, they're Satan's children, and God allows that army to come against us. But you still have power over them, and you must always remember that. Why? You're on a rock that cannot be shaken. They shall run to and fro in the city, and they shall run upon the wall, and they shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. This lets you know they're not locust insects, that they're people. And they'll come in a window a lot of times through antennae, right into your boob tube. Isn't that what they call the television? Whatever, okay. All right. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. In other words, when those locusts come out of the pit, there's so many of them, as it is written in Revelation chapter 9, the sky is darkened, which is a fake appearance of Messiah, because it's also dark when the true Messiah comes because of his light, as I forestated. And we see then, let's skip to verse 10. The earth shall quake before them and heaven shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. Okay, we got that. Let's go 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Now you underline that in your mind. God's controlling or is allowing that army. Why? He's checking out his people. How many of them are studied? How many of them have covered the letter that he has sent? And how many can be had? How many will sell their soul? All he wants is your love. And not too many people know how to love him because they won't read his letter. A letter of love that he's written to them. His army for his camp is very great for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? You can. But you've got to have the truth. You've got to know who your enemy is. And by enemy, that I mean you have to know who to watch, who to be careful of. And I think any Christian knows it's the tares. You've got to watch the tares. Christ told us that. You know something? There's nothing new about that. The first the very first prophecy ever issued in the Word of God, Genesis 3, 15 and 16, was that Satan would bruise the heels of Messiah, Christ, but we would bruise his head. That means we're the bruisers, okay? And we're gonna do it with God's help, of course. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me, with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. When you see this trouble, 
You want to know we're at that door. No, you don't have to worry about Iran. Well, be concerned. You don't have to worry about Iraq all that much. Be concerned. But our real enemy comes from the Kenite, the tear. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. You know, our Father is very forgiving. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast and call a solemn assembly. That's really what Passover is about. This is an assembly to learn truth, to serve our God, and to partake of our Passover, which is the Lord's table, Holy Communion. Locusts haven't got to that real wine, his blood that paid for our sins. And that body, received the stripes, but we get the healing. He did that for us. Why? Because he loves us. But he wants you to know the truth and he wants you to know who to be careful about and around. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. In other words, gather the whole family. Usually, babies were not allowed at part of these, but this is the end. This is different. I want you to go down to verse 20, what God's going to do for us with that army. Verse 20 reads, But I will remove far off from you the northern army. That's the locust. And will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost, utmost sea, and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. God's not happy with that. God expects his people to take a bigger interest to protect themselves whereby he can be proud of them. Every father likes to be, and mother like to be proud of their children in that way. Fear not, O land, and be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. You can count on it, friend, but you better know who the enemy is. You better know which way to look to see that you're not sacked up in deception and die a spiritual death, not a flesh death, a spiritual death with deception when that enemy appears working great miracles in this world. You haven't seen anything yet. God, through the Son, said, if I, didn't, if I hadn't shortened the time, not even, there would be no flesh saved. That's how convincing he is to a non-believer. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree, the vine, do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, the beginning of the year, okay? You know, our Father's always good to us. Do you know what the latter rain is? The latter rain causes the fruit to come all the way ripe and rich and moist. The farmer rain sprouts the seed. We're talking about teaching here. We're talking about you receiving truth from God's word raining down into your mind from the word of God, bringing you to that point that you can see, know, and understand what it is your father would have you to do. And he always sees that you have that rain, that moisture. When you follow and when you read, when you study. And you know, a lot of times you have trouble and you think, that just doesn't come clear. Then pray about it. 
Ask him to lead you in it. Ask him to explain it. He loves to. He loves to help you spiritually. It'll just fall into your mind paragraphs at a time. The clarity when you've studied and done your part, your homework. Listen to what he's going to do, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Did you have doubt we were talking about locust? The canker worm. That's the nor. And the caterpillar. That's the swarma. And the palmer worm, the devourer. My great army, which I sent among you. God sent them. Do you know why? To check the children out. To find out if you're playing church or if you know what he's talking about. To find out if you've done your homework or you're just a play actor. You know, um, there, were many, there are many play actors. And God doesn't like that. That's kind of Greek hypocrite. Okay? Likes to play something. Play a part. Christianity is not a play. And it's not a religion. It's reality. It's real. Christ is real. His truth is real. And this world is very, very real. And do you know how it's all going to end? Exactly the way it's written. Exactly. No ifs, no ands, no buts. And you shall... And in verse 26, and you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wonderfully, wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. You know, that's a beautiful thing. Don't you hate to be ashamed? Don't you hate to be had? Somebody make a fool out of you? Then stay in God's word. Don't, we're, you're living in a generation that many people will take part in the apostasy. That's simply to be made a fool of. It's much seriouser than that because it's selling your soul. 27, and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Now, now that's good news, my friend, and that's when you want to look up. But at the same time, like I told you, I'm kind of giving you a pop test. Who's your enemy? Who are you concerned about? You want to really watch closely and stay focused on Satan's little army. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. In other words, those seven spirits of God go into the 7,000 and that truth will go over the world when you're delivered up to witness before that false Messiah. God protecting you all the way. You have nothing to worry about. Don't ever let your heart grow faint. Quite frankly, you've heard this old Marine say many times that a coward dies a thousand deaths a brave man dies once. Nobody's going to die. Okay? Because God has given Satan orders. Don't, you can't touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. That means those of you that know the truth, that have that truth. So again, we find those coming against our worst enemy that you have a part in it with God touching you, leading you, and protecting you. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaidens in those days will I pour out my spirit. That's that Holy Spirit, those seven spirits. It applies to both men and women. It's God's army, the true army. And I will show wonders in the heaven and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. It's coming. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. 
For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord had said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I don't know. Did you hear that? Has he called you? Have you heard that call? You know, it comes in many ways. It might just be touching your heart to let you know that you've got to serve him regardless of what. That you have to study his word. That you have to absorb it. And you say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Because he's looking for that election. And he has called them. He called them before the foundations of this earth, quite frankly. The real enemy that you must watch is this one we've just covered. As I said, it's real easy to sidetrack yourself and start worrying about nations. And it is serious. But don't, for heaven's sakes, take your eye off the mark. That's to say Satan's army, for he is the one that is the danger behind it all. And besides that, God intends to use you to go against him. So it's important as we take inventory and we see so much trouble in the nations and we see them. You notice Satan's army didn't thrust each other. They were so disciplined that when they marched, they never touched. It wasn't a mob. It wasn't an undisciplined lot. Like you see a lot of armies that are so gangly and so clumsy and so awkward that you think, man, I could just take one squad of good Marines and wipe that whole bunch out. You know, They're so crude. These were sharp. They were really well trained. And, and what I'm saying is they are disciplined in what they do to the max. So that's your enemy. That's who you're against. But he that is in us is mightier than he that is in them. They're following a dead man. And you're following life eternal, our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for the many warnings. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for being with us, Father. And Father, let each of these be a blessing to all they come in contact with, Father. Let them know that one of your children has been in their midst. Lead, guide, direct, and touch in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Because in believing it, it becomes truth. It's a fact. So you, you tighten up your girt just a little bit and you hang on. We're going to get through it. Denise from Oklahoma. Genesis twenty-eight eighteen talks about Jacob's pillar. And in Dr. Bullinger's notes, he says this is not the coronation stone in London. I was under the impression that it was. Please comment. You want to always remember, Dr. Bullinger passed away in the year of our Lord, 1915, okay? And for what he had to work with, he accomplished a great, great, great deal. And he makes a statement by quoting a geologist that stipulated that that particular stone could never have come from Jerusalem, but... In the transferring of that stone to Canada during World War II, we had a chip 
came loose. And in modern day geology, we were traced and find out about the only place it can be found is Jerusalem. That is to say, in the area of that stone of destiny. So, uh, you know, um, we have to give credit where credit's due. Don't, don't hold that against Dr. Bullinger, but I still have to insist that um, that is the stone. And uh, we, we have a, a book in our library on that subject. It might help you if you're very interested. Hollis from Florida. You say there is no global warning, warming. I don't understand how you can say that when in New Zealand the ice caps have significantly been melted. And I know I've seen them. Something has to be melting them. You mean when the ice flows come down and they break off and they just chunk right off into the water like that like just you do you not understand why they come down and they they're growing okay the ice cap is growing and when it gets to the water it's got to break off okay uh, soon, pretty soon as it gets warmer water so what you're saying doesn't mean a thing okay it means quite the contrary it means the ice flows and ice caps are growing, or they wouldn't be breaking off. They would simply be melting and water running down. But there are huge chunks coming loose. So, uh, you know, God controls the weather. Man doesn't. And man, though he has polluted and polluted and polluted, God will still manage to control the weather. And um, it... I know uh, it, um, they say, we're in danger of global warming. You should grab it, look like a tornado went through here this winter by ice, ice breaking over trees. I mean, you could step outside at night when you live in the country like I do, and you didn't dare go out into the timber because treetops were falling right and left. And you talk to me about global warming? We were without electricity for a whole week. This chapel ran a big generator to broadcast for a whole week, and you talked to me about global warming because it was of, uh, of an ice age right here. Um, you know, um, you want to you want to be real careful. You know, when you mess around with the stories, you can get gored. Okay, it's a dangerous thing. You could get gored real bad. Okay, Terry from North Carolina. Sir, I've been watching for four or so years, and, and you have brought me closer to religion. Well, God bless you. Question, why does it seem media and other platforms try to disprove God? Sinners, atheists, and also uh, it just is Satan's way of trying to grab control, and that should let you know all the more that we are that closer to the very end itself, because quite frankly, he kind of thought it would come to that. Okay, Deb, Lily, Lily from Texas. Okay, Lily wants, I think, my God for you, thank you. Why does, uh, I have two, I have a question for Many mansions. Why does Jesus say, My Father has many mansions? This leads people to believe in some Christians that we're going to live in heaven. I already know we're not, but why does he say that? Well, because he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and the word mansions is mono in the Greek. And it doesn't mean like you do in the English, some big house, it means resting place. And Christ went, he prepared the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our, advis, our advisor, um, our counselor for our comfort. He prepared that place where you can rest in that today. You don't have to wait till you're in heaven. Heaven's wherever God is and God's returning to earth. So that's where I want to be. And that's where uh, all of those mansions are. The whole 14th chapter of St. John, which you're quoting from here, um, has to do with being with God and the Son, dwelling with them, abiding with them. And that word, uh, mano and mino, 
or, or coexist throughout, which means dwelling and resting in Christ and in God. And wherever they both are, you have that rest. You have that Holy Spirit. Uh, heaven is a condition of being in the presence of God. In the Hebrew tongue, the Shekinah glory means God dwells there. Even in Yahweh Shema in the Hebrew tongue means God dwells there. Okay, And that's, that's what makes heaven wherever he is. It doesn't matter. But it's going to be. He, he, cre he made an eternal covenant with Mount Zion. That's Jerusalem. And he says it's his favorite place in the universe, not just the world, the universe. And that's why he made that covenant. He took her to wife. He watched her born an unclean birth by the Jebusites called Jebus. David captured it and named it Jerusalem, city of peace. And God said, I put my cloak over her, which I watched her grow and mature into a young woman. And I placed my cloak over her, which is a biblical marriage. And I took her to wife. He's going to be there forever, Jerusalem. Clarence from Nevada. That's Ezekiel 16, if you want to check me out on that. Clarence from Nevada. From what I understand, the elect are predestined because they have earned the right from the first earth age. But if someone used to be an atheist and converts, is it still possible that they are one of God's elect? Absolutely. Just because one doesn't believe in God by what is taught in this world on some circles is understandable. That, that may sound cruel, but it's true. I'm, I'm talking to intelligent people. And, um, but having been an atheist and even practiced it at one time, which is non-belief, has nothing to do with God's ability and price he paid on the cross to forgive you and to use you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your teaching. I study with you every day via the internet. Well, you are so welcome, and we're, we're proud to have you with us. Um, Paula from, from Missouri. Okay. I, my concern is this. When the Antichrist returns, if I better read a little more. I have a concern I haven't heard addressed on Shep at Shepherd's Chapel. I am married to a non-believer. He is a compassionate man. <clears throat> Excuse me. He uh, doesn't prevent or discourage my study of God's Word. He works hard to support us, and I take care of our home and finances. I know we are one in God's eyes, and He is sanctified because of my belief. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you got that right. And my concern is this. When the Antichrist returns, if my husband chooses to participate in the one world system, so he can buy and sell. Will I also receive the mark of the beast through his particip participation? No. Uh, it's what you believe in your mind that God goes by. Okay. It's not what you eat necessarily, other than he does give us the health laws, which is not a sin to hell to eat wrong, but it'll make you sicker than a dog sometimes. You know, you want to... You want to protect yourself, all of his advice, but it's what you believe in your mind. You do not worship Satan, so don't worship him, and you're in good shape. That may sound confusing, but simply look at it as what is faithful and what isn't, and you got it, okay? You're still faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you have a good husband, as long as, as it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as long as he does not prevent you, um, you may even, I wouldn't sell him out to worshiping Antichrist when he sees your witness against him. Uh, he's, I, my guess is he's going to back you up, girl. Christ, uh, Christian, Kristen, uh, I think that's what this is, and from Oklahoma. Chris and Stan, I got it now. It's a man and a woman, all kind of jammed together here. Uh, from Oklahoma, I know to be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord, but why in the Old Testament do we see so many examples 
of importance of where someone is buried, Joseph for one. I know there is a simple reason uh, I must have missed it. Well, it, um, because uh, the dignity and respect for family, to see that they're put away nice, okay, and that, that it's simply respect for what they were with us, yet knowing where they truly are. In other words, we can't, we would not be a very civilized people if someone died and we just drug them out to pasture like we do an old horse, okay? That wouldn't go over very good and it'd make us look kind of bad. So burial is biblically correct, always has been, and a proper burial was looked upon. When you read, read of Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, where he's the son of mourning, uh, you're going into the pit. He, it is stated there that he would not be afforded a decent burial, okay, as someone of prestige should have, all right? It's respect and dignity for loved ones, period. And uh, think of it in that respect. Donald from Florida. I recently realized that the lifespan of the locust from May to September adds to 153 days the same number as the amount of fish Peter pulled from the net. This number is the time of Noah's Ark was on the water. Do you have any comments? Our first big mama, 33 foot, we were real surprised when it was laid down and delivered to us. We put it up ourselves. The serial number was 153. And I'm out of time. Hey, I gotta get signed off here real quick. I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, He loves you for it, okay? You make His day, He's gonna make yours. Now. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, He will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me. You stay in His Word every day. In His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.